it, it kind of leads to a another story the the bigger story of failure to me um you know shortly after that happened and i was i wasn't able to keep the the ship propped up and get things back in line and and by the way that was not the, the company was not really upset about that because it wasn't a business unit that they were it used to be long story short it used to be a big part of their revenue it became a smaller part of their revenue as it went on so it wasn't a big deal if it failed it was just an opportunity for me to try but you know most stressful time of my life and then i had my head injury and i collapsed and i fractured the four bones of my skull and had two brain hemorrhages you know they look for drugs alcohol aneurysms all the scary scary stuff chalked it up to stress what well, was probably the most stressful time of my life so about eight months after that as i'm getting better I thought I needed a change in life. And I did. I needed a change in, in work, in my attitude, in my mentality. But where my mind went was that I needed a change in my relationship. Started. Yeah. I don't know if you need any explanation or what I'm doing. This is my, like, I'm, I've done a lot of research on this. I use particular products, the Fear Medallion, mm -hmm. um, known as kind of the best to do. Now, when I spend... Seven hundred fifty, eight hundred dollars on a shoe, which is rare. Maybe once every couple years, I'll have these. I've probably had these eight years. I keep them and I take care of them um, because it was important to me to get to the level that I could buy them. So I don't own a ton of these, but when I do, I take care of them. So that's why I have the stuff I have. Okay, you can just go ahead and explain it. I'll listen. Yeah. No, I mean it's 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 simple, you know. Essentially, like what you're doing, particularly with leather shoes and the and the coloring that's on here, is I'm using a conditioner to start off, and less is more when it comes to these things. People love to glob this stuff on, but less is more. And all this is doing is conditioning the shoe, removing anything that was on there previously, and it's going to allow me to do. You know, a big misconception is that if you use a brown or if you 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 know you use a different color that it's going to stain your shoe. Well, it's not a shoe stain, it's a polish. A lot of times guys do, and I do it too, I'll use black polish on my brown shoes because it gives them like a little film of patina on there. So it's kind of neat to see, but they don't look black. They don't look like they've been colored black. So I put this on and I start this this way. What I'm doing today is what I would call like almost like a full executive shine where I'm doing a conditioner. I'll let that sit for a few minutes and then I will put on a polish on top of that and then I'm going to put together something on there to make it glossy. I don't typically like my shoes very glossy, but every once in a while I will just to give them that that fully cleaned up look so that people notice when I'm there. <laughs> Would you consider this an everyday shoe or a dream shoe? This is my dream shoe. This is there are a few shoes, you know, at at $800 that I paid for these this is, I'm wearing my everyday shoe, but, but this is, I will not at some point, regardless of how much money I make, you know, I am never going to spend $3,000 on shoes. You know, it, it just, there's a diminishing sense of return. It's like, if I buy something cheaper, I can buy something cheaper and it won't last as long. Even if I take care of it, if I take care of these, I've got Gucci shoes that I've had for 20 years and they look brand new. And it's like, I just, I believe in taking care of my things, whether that's my car, my apartment, my dogs, like anything that, you know, people are always like, I can't believe you spent that money on shoes. And I'm like, yeah, but look at, look at how I take care of them too. You know, like it's different. If I just ran through these every couple of years, but you know, these are going on eight years that I've had these. And so, so I just let this sit in and it sits in just for a couple of minutes, but no, this is a dream pair you know, the brand Ferragamo to me was like, I got to a certain point in my career a few years ago and wanted to always own a pair and see if they were worth it and um they've been phenomenal so this is this is as high and as much as i'd probably spend on a shoe yeah so i'm gonna switch it out because i can oh, this one is almost dry enough you know it typically sits two to three minutes if you really want to do it you can sit it overnight because the the leather is soaking in this oil um i then take a horsehair brush and I buff it all out before I get to kind of the next level that I do. There's three steps that I typically do when it comes to polishing. And then I will sometimes add a layer on the sole. Um, I have some stuff that I didn't bring that you put on here. And it's a conditioner that helps keep this for the winter and the snow and the rain helps keep these protected a little bit. One thing I don't do with my shoes is, 
know, I've got a $1,200 pair of boots. Like I'll spend the money on shoes, but I baby them and taking care of them. I will wear them in the rain. I, to me, they're tools. It's the same thing as I treat my guns. Like I, I take care of them, but like it's a tool. My, my actual tools, I beat the hell out of them, but I clean them up. But like, this is a tool to me. Like it's, it's, it's nice to have at the same time. If it's raining outside, I have no problem wearing them because I'll, I'll take care of them. So I, I see things as, you know, it's like, it's like cars, like people will have one car and then their garage queen, they're like Ferrari or something like that. Like to me, it's like, no, if you have it, like, what's the point of owning a Ferrari if you're not going to drive it? What's the point of having shoes like this? And I'm not, you know, you might see me wear these at players club sometimes, but not all the time, but like I'll wear them out, you know, and have no problem, no problem doing that. So I just do a quick brush now that that's soaked in. And then I'm going to put a brown shoe polish on top of that. It took me a while to feel comfortable affording these. It took me 15 years before I decided that I was going to make the step to spend that kind of money on a shoe. What makes a dream shoe a dream shoe? You know, I'll be honest, I think, I think part of it is there's a status. I think for me, I will see men in really nice clothing, you know, and they'll spend two, three thousand dollars on a suit, but it's not tailored. And so it's like you can go to places and get a five hundred, three hundred dollar suit, get it tailored, make it look just as good. Shoes and belts are one thing that stand out to me when I see, I feel like I notice when people, if you have those things down, you probably have the rest of your outfit down. For me, it was when I go into work, I've got the whole Deion Sanders mentality, look good, feel good, feel good, play good, play good, pay good. So I go in, I wear these at home. Even if, if, if this, if I weren't dressed the way I were today to wear my shoes that are like my everyday shoes, I'd probably have these shoes on. I dress up at home when I'm working from home the same way that I dress up going into work. So it's a, it's a feeling of, you know, if I put on like slippers or something, I'm mentally, it, it's pathetic in a lot of ways, but mentally I am more geared up to get what I need to get done if I'm dressed that way. So like this dream shoe, like, is there a status component? Sure. But I don't really care about that as much as I want someone to look at me and I don't need them to say, oh, he's wearing Ferragamo, he's wearing Gucci, but I do want them to look at me and say, okay, well, he takes care of his stuff. I can take him seriously. I've noticed that in business and in my roles, dressing nicer gets you more respect and more attention, right or wrong, it, it does. So I, I put an emphasis on that to make sure I do that. And then it was also just that I've heard they're unbelievably comfortable. And so I wanted to see what that was like. You know, you spend eight hours a day in something, you know, you, just, you want a comfortable bed, right? Like, I, I want to make sure my shoes are comfortable too. Is it true that they are unbelievably comfortable? No. Actually not. I would love to say these and the Gucci's. I think that Ferragamo has been more comfortable. These are the only Ferragamo's I own. I own three pairs of Gucci's. Not one of those is comfortable. Um, I think it depends on the leather and there are certain brands that use like a, a calf leather that's certainly much more comfortable. But I'd love to say it, it kind of makes you feel stupid once you buy it though because you go, okay, well, I thought this was going to be more comfortable, but if I'm telling the truth, they're not uncomfortable, but they're not for that amount of money. It's not like my everyday shoe that I feel completely comfortable in and I can lay on the couch in. So all I did there is just applied a brown cream to it on top of it. So I'll let that dry and I'll clean off the next one do the same thing. What's the significance of a brown cream? Brown cream here in this sense, it's not filling in any cracks. All it's doing is bringing out the natural pigment of the coloring. The, the first was, was a renovator. The renovator is a shoe conditioner. The second one is just bringing out the pigments that are in there. And like I said, you can use a black and it won't darken the shoe. It's not what people think, but 
using a brown on brown. I have certain shoes that are light that might be a little too light and I'll use a black to have them. You would never tell that a black shoe polish was used on them, but it, it would change the pigment just a little bit enough where you could see that they turned a little bit darker. So I typically, I like to do it on the front of the shoe. I like to have that um, contrast, not where it's like a black line, but it's like, you can even see here where I've done it before, it's a little darker up here because I've used black on the front here. Um, but that's what the cream does is bring out the pigment of the shoe. And I do this, you know, if I took these out in the rain, I'd do it as soon as I get home. I think if I were to tell everyone, you know, getting your shoe cream, doing, taking care of your shoes, like it's important. But if there was one thing I would tell everyone to do, and I have maybe 15 pair of these, it's shoe trees, shoe trees. And, and you really only need a couple, like in the sense that a shoe tree is not expanding the leather at all. All it's doing is soaking up the sweat or potentially rain or any situation from there. So you could actually have one pair. And after you wear the shoes, you put your shoe trees in there for 30 minutes or an hour, you can take them out later and put them in the next shoe because it's not holding the mold to the shoe. It's not supposed to. All it's supposed to do is take that moisture out of it. So I have them in all my shoes just because I like to have them ready all the time, but it's not a necessity. And so I'm just doing the same thing here, just, to, just applying a little bit of cream to it. And I let that sit for a little bit as well. And then what I'll put on is an actual polish that will make these pop a lot more. Where you put the polish, that type of like wax glass finish polish is very important on the shoe. Putting it on the crease will show the creases when you walk. So you need to make sure that you put it in places where the shoe is not going to crease. The rest of this is meant to soak in. But that last step is meant to be just in certain parts of the shoe. Who taught you how to clean shoes? The internet. I, um, you know, my dad took care of his shoes, but nothing like this. He never owned anything like this. And he had basic shoe polish. And so I went to, um, there's a group called The Hanger Project, Kirby Allison, and he sells Saphir Medallion, and then it's just a men's kind of how to be a gentleman. I think it's a little too proper for me overall in terms of the way that he does things and stores things, et cetera. I don't need to kind of get to that level. Um, but there were probably 10, 12 YouTube videos, and I, I watched them all, and I've watched them repeatedly. I do this process, and I still watch them. I still look at them because like, I want to perfect it and go, did I miss something? Is there something else I can do? But the importance to me about this is not really about the shoe. It really isn't about keeping the shoe clean. It's therapeutic to me. So if I'm sitting down having a drink or I put music on and I do two or three pair of shoes, I'm in a, I do the same thing cleaning a gun. Like I prefer it to going to compete and shooting, but like it's therapeutic to me is to do this and like, or quietness and I just, got this time and it's like, it's not about going, man, you know, I never do it because I'm about to go out that night. I'll have it done already because I used it as a form of calming my anxiety and cooling me off at the end of the day. So it's not an everyday thing, but once a week I do a couple pairs. When you say this process is therapeutic, what does it mean for something to be therapeutic as someone with anxiety? For me, I can still have those, I can still have that mentality where I'm anxious about something, where I'm anxious about work or relationships. Um, but what it allows me to do is escape for a little bit and focus on something and improve. And in, in those moments where I'm going through darker depression or going through deeper anxiety, I have found that what works for me is not to grab a drink. It's not to sit down and watch TV. It's to be productive. It's to get something done and it, even if it's not the thing I have anxiety about, I, I've got anxiety about things I got to do when I get home today, but maybe I don't do those first. Maybe I go, I'm packing because I'm moving. Maybe I pack up some more stuff before I get to that, just because me moving forward and making progress in some sort of situation 
makes me feel good. So this is one of those situations that allows me to do that, particularly at the end of the night when there's nothing else going on anyway. And I'm not someone who can just, I'm not really good at sitting there and watching TV. Sitting watching TV actually <laughs> gives me anxiety. Makes me feel like I'm not doing anything. So if I'm watching TV, I'm probably doing something like this or folding clothes. How does watching TV give you anxiety? Feels like I should be doing something else, like I'm wasting my time. It's, it's that and depending on what I watch. I, I, there's a lot of times like if I watch something, you know, Yellowstone to me is a good show because it's deep enough where you can pay attention, but you can also do other things around the house. But say it's, um, you know, I just watched Interstellar for the first time the other day and needed to really pay attention. Well, I'm not always in the mood to sit there and pay attention. I'm not always in the mood to give you two hours. Like that's, that's not me. So I was in the mood to watch that. And as I watched it, I enjoyed it more. So that's a situation where I'm not cleaning my shoes or doing something else. Then I am watching. <clears throat> that's just a rare situation where, <clears throat> and it's because it invokes feeling to me. Those movies, whether it's not that I see myself in them, but I see myself in certain situations and I see myself saying, what would I do in this situation? You know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, how would I treat this? You know, so I like those types of situations, but when it comes to cleaning shoes, I'm typically doing something where I'm not paying as much attention to it. So that's why like TV for me has never been a huge, even when I moved to my new place, my the representative for Verizon was talking to me. He goes, how much do you watch TV? And I was like, not never. And he's like, we're canceling it. He's like, if you want to keep Netflix, he's like, but I'm going to lower your bill from 180 to $70 a month. He's like, you want to get a Netflix subscription, something like that. But he's like, you know, I'm not, there's no point in, because when it comes to football, I watch Red Zone. When you're a Commanders fan, you don't want to watch three hours of football. <laughs> so I, I like to see, I like to see everything that's going on. So I'll watch it. I'll watch it that way. But yeah, there, there's just something about TV that for me is just very difficult to sit there and feel relaxed without thinking of other things. There are certain things I do in my life that take me away from the normal day, anxiety or depression. TV is not one of them. I know for a lot of folks, it's grabbing a drink or TV. I've tried them both. It doesn't work for me. You mind if I grab you a glass of water? Oh, please do. Okay. Thank you. Your right side. <clears throat> Since you got less left stuff over there. This is perfect, actually. Use my right hand free. And this is the last step that I do on here, which is just apply this polish, which again, you don't have to do all the time. The one thing that I will do if I'm just doing something simple is just that conditioner. I just make sure I have that conditioner on my shoes. That seems to be enough for how I like my stuff to look. I don't like my stuff to look too flashy. Do you remember the sacrifices you made to acquire your new shoe? Every single one. I remember them like it was yesterday. I mean, I was, 
I was in brokerage and, um, you know, it was a sales role in commercial real estate. So we were placing loans the same way that a person would place a loan on a house. We were doing it on apartments and other commercial buildings. And, um, you know, that was, it was the most anxious time of my life because it was a, a situation where it was an eat what you kill situation. So, you know, some months you'd make nothing, some months you'd make 60. So it's like, you know, and when... I did two things, not at first, but over the first year when I started doing well, and I did well as a part of a team, um, and we can get back to this later, I failed when I had to do it on my own. When 10 of my team members left and it was just two of us and I tried to prop up the ship, I couldn't get it done. It was too much. And um, But for those three years that things were going well, like that's when I bought my dream car. That's when I bought my dream pair of shoes. That's when I bought a nice suit. You know, and then put the rest of the money away, but um, had always wanted those things. And so that's how I, that's, I measured it by a sense of income and a sense of, I had not, shoes I don't necessarily long for. I don't really sit there and look up shoes. If I do that, it's more sneakers than it is for these types of shoes. Because I'll be honest with you. You know, these are eight years old. If I went to go buy these today, I bet they have the ones that looked almost the exact same. Like a lot of these shoes just kind of look the exact same, you know? So like it was my dream shoe in terms of a brand and in terms of fit and what I wanted, but it was never something that was meant to be like, this is what I always aspire to have. But when it came to having nice shoes, this was the brand and this was the shoe that I really wanted. But the sacrifices you talked about and the things that it took me to get there in terms of, it meant being uncomfortable a lot. I am, I'm an INFJ in terms of the Myers-Briggs. And I know that because I've had to take it four times. Well, we're 1.5% of the population, we're the smallest one, but I stands for introvert. A lot of people, and like the way you know me, might think I'm more extroverted than I am. People who know me really close, including my parents and my old boss, who was a really introspective guy, goes, no, you are an introvert. You are very introverted. And sometimes people say an introverted extrovert, take that how you want. But for me, it's if I have to turn it on at work, I had to be uncomfortable in turning it on and talking to people about stuff like commercial real estate that candidly, I didn't want to talk about. Like you and I can rap and have good conversations about stuff, but we're talking about stuff that one of us cares about and likely both of us care about. Guess how much I care about commercial real estate? Guess how much I care, you know, what I do when I explain it to people like working in real estate, private equity, I'm like, if it's the right person, I say, you know what, in all honesty, I do, I make old white men rich. That's what I actually do. But to me, going through the, those situations, um, and it ended up not being a right fit for me career-wise, but that getting uncomfortable and having to do those things, this was almost like reparations for that. Like I, It was like, if I'm going to go through all this pain, if it's going to be this difficult for me, the anxiety, the the just dreading going to conferences, doing, having those meetings, like, let me get something out of it. You know, here's, here's a, it's almost a band-aid for a bullet wound, but here's a way to feel good in spite of not feeling good about what I do and about where I was. I mean, I think the issue with commercial real estate for me, and I struggled with it then and now less fortunately, because I'm in a, a better role with a better group, but is that there's no social utility in what we do. We're not, saving the manatees here. Like it's literally about making people money. I've always struggled with that. You know, during COVID I volunteered at a dog shelter for, for two years because that was important to me to give my time to do something like that. Um, but I've always struggled with that. And so going through that, when I got to the point where I could afford to buy something like this, then, then I did it. say that there's a price that you pay mentally for your dreams or your dreams very much so Ment uh, particularly mentally and you know what it's interesting because I've thought about this a lot for the folks who were good at that let's take brokerage for example but sales just in general for the folks who are good at that that's just kind of how they are in general for me there was a price to pay because for me it was I don't want to say selling out who I am, but it was compromising who I was to do it. And I was, here's why I was not a good salesman. People would come to me 
and I would know of other programs and people would come to me and say, hey, can you do X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, a good broker or a good salesman in terms of like success, we'd be like, yeah, we can do it. And they'll probably change that up on someone along the way and not get them exactly what they want. I'm someone, you know, I come from a humble background. My dad was a military government. My mom's a teacher. They don't understand the money in this industry. Well, I didn't either. And when people would ask me, I'd say, I can't. But you know, someone who could, I can make an introduction for you. And so in a lot of ways that would help. I think in some industries that helps build clients because it helps build trust. In my industry, it's what have you done for me lately? So me doing that, they were thankful, but they didn't come back to me. And then they would, they would rather go with the person who, if they've got these huge dreams of how they wanted to do things, they'd rather go with someone who promises that but falls short versus someone who just says they can't do it off the jump. And I'm not someone who can promise you something and fall short. I mean, that there are things beyond my control potentially, but me going into that, knowing that, I couldn't sleep at night. I don't know if your camera can see this, but you can see the difference with the polish and the, and the knot. That one is shinier and that one's not, but that's the difference between once it gets completely polished off and then there's one more. There's more body and texture to it. Yeah. There's actually a wrap that you take to these two, which there's just not enough space here, but you just put it on your leg and you take this like cloth wrap and just shimmy it across and it helps a little bit, but I just don't. I learned that, you know, the other place that I learned to shine shoes, interestingly enough, was a guy in my building 10 years ago who would be in there during the day and would shine folks shoes for $10. My dad always told me, he said, if you got a shoe shine kit, you never lose a job. You always have a job. So I paid attention to what he did and I asked him questions and he used some of the sim similar products, does it a little differently from me. But I learned from him because I was like, all right, well, this is this guy's career. Like, this is what this guy knows. Like, and um, it was my first kind of foray. Even if, if I wear these shoes now, like now, like these shoes are done, but like, if I wore these shoes to an airport and they weren't as clean as they are now, but there's a shoe shine there, I'll do it. Because if I'm wearing these to an airport, I'm probably getting off for something for work or something, and I wanna look good, I wanna look presentable. So I'll do it. And it's also kind of a way of supporting someone. I like those two things. Those things help me, so. Would you say that thought process is a business decision and a presentation decision that a lot of people don't consider. Yes. Yes. And I worry about, I don't worry about how it comes across when I do it. You know, I had an analyst at my old job a couple years ago. You know, when I, when I go into work, this is the, this is the, the lowest I'd be. And it's typically like on a Friday. Um, and even now you go into work and folks, you know, when I first started working in the industry, we had to wear shirts and ties but now it's like polos and jeans and stuff. And I just don't feel as good. I'm feeling a little too relaxed and I don't feel my best. Um, but, you know, had an analyst <laughs> jokingly come up to me at the Christmas party and goes, you know, I wasn't wearing a shirt and tie or even a, a, a jacket every day, but I'd wear a button down with nice slacks. And he would say to me, hey, we need you to cool out on what you're wearing because you're making the rest of us look bad. And I'm like, well, that's on you, not on me. But, you know, it was just, I think there is something to be said. I know that personally, I'll take everybody seriously, but when I see the man who walks into a room confident and dresses well and has his stuff together, I probably listen to him more. So it's, it's a subconscious movement on myself where I'm not going, man, I want to be that guy. But, you know, I look at things and the way that I see people, like people that I look up to, I, you know, I don't, I don't care whatever your profession is, you know, brain surgeon, you know, who is he like? What does she look like? The person that you want to be, the person that you see, like, how do they dress? How do they act? How do they talk? Those stereotypes, the sooner that, you know, or, or maybe characteristics, the sooner we accept them and you put your own spin on things. You don't just emulate everything, but they took care of the process for you to some degree saying, Hey, I, you don't know exactly how they got there, but you know you want to be where they are now. Here's a way to do that, is to start with saying, okay, well, let me look the part. 
you know, my buddy was an SF guy, was a special forces guy, and they had a saying that said, know what you're doing, look good doing it. If you don't know what you're doing, look good doing it. So I try and go into things, I'll go into things a little bit more dressed than typical. You know, I could go into Players Club in jeans, my dunks, and a, and a t-shirt, and sometimes I have, but I will go in a little bit over what it is, not to stand out, but just to feel a little better and feel kind of good. Were there any failures leading up to your dream purchase? Notable failures. Notable failures, not with regard to my dream purchase, but there were notable failures right and left and a lot of things I couldn't control um, that stuck with me. I've never been one of those folks you know, people say, don't worry about what you can't control. Well, I'm the opposite. I don't worry about what I can control because if I can control it, I'll get it done. 99 out of 100 times, I'll get it done. It's the things I can't control that I worry about. So that logic has never made sense to me. If you're someone who gets things done and you you treat it like you're an intern and you you work your tail off to to succeed and and produce results that are strong, you don't have to worry about the things that you can control. Like, you have to worry about the things you can't control. And a lot of that, particularly in that industry when I was working in brokerage, was dealing with people who treated me like a, I'm a salesman, so they didn't trust me. Well, I was a salesman, so that's fair. But I'm not someone who's untrustworthy either. So that was a big mental hurdle for me to have people treat me like that. You know, to this day, outside of just spam calls, but when someone calls and I, I pick up and they're pitching me something, I listen to it and I do it out of respect because so many people hung up on me and when I would take it so personal. Not that they would hang up, they'd just be like, I don't have time for this, I gotta go, or like, I'll call you back or something like that. And it's like, I'm not that, you know, they tell wide receivers in the NFL have a short memory because if you drop a pass, you gotta get back out there. Well, I don't have that, I, I'm, I'm not like that. Like, if I drop to that pass, I'm thinking about it on the next play. Now I'm eager to get out there but I'm still thinking about it. So those people who treated me like that and those people who wouldn't take my calls and give me an opportunity, when you're supposed to make, you know, it was never set like make 20 calls a day, but you know, you do want to be making a bunch of calls and like a sales role, that not getting traction, getting traction with someone in one of the first few calls could make my entire day. And, and fall, calls could fall off from there where people I couldn't, didn't get traction with, but I'd at least say, hey, you know, I succeeded in getting a little bit done, but when, you know, the first half of the calls, I couldn't get traction or I couldn't get done what I needed to get done for reasons out of my control or that felt out of my control, I would most likely quit. I would most likely give up because I, I couldn't handle it mentally. It was too much for me. What's the balancing act that comes with working in private equity? So now it's interesting because my group, you know, private equity was we raised funds from from large groups, high net worth individuals, pension funds, hedge funds, and we used that money to deploy into buying and building assets. I now work for a real estate investment trust, so it's a it's a public company. Um, you know, in terms of that, it's understanding how a public company works and understanding that you work for the shareholders and understanding the team mentality, I think what they taught me, and I wish I had learned this earlier in my career was when we go into an opportunity and we're gonna buy something or typically we're gonna build something, when you do it, think of it as if you own it. And we do, we don't get a piece of the ownership, but there's a bonus and there's a, there's a structure of getting um, stock options. And so you do in a lot of ways. So I do look at these things and treat them as if if I owned it, what would I do? How do I protect this house? How do I best put us in position to succeed and take enough risk without leveraging me or my coworkers or the people that trust in me? Um, and I've been given a lot of trust to do that. And so it's been, a, it's been an interesting process over the past five weeks. private compared to public what would you say the initial differences between the structures you know it's funny i worked for a company 
By the way, what I'm putting on here is just a dressing that goes on the sole, on the outside sole of the shoe to help keep it brown because it gets scuffed up a lot. So it's kind of a balancing act to do this, but because my hands shake. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I worked for a company that went public while I was there. Back in 2010, my company went from private to public and it changed overnight. Literally the culture. Now you're responsible to shareholders. You're responsible to... Um, you know, everything that drives that stock price. So all the joking and all the fun that we had, certain comments you made, things like that, you can no longer do because you have to assume when you're on a phone call, we'd sit there and go, okay, who's on the call? And then as soon as the call hung up, we'd double check multiple times that no one was on that call because if someone hears it and word gets out on a Yahoo message board, the CEO said X, Y, and Z, now you're in deep trouble. So the biggest change is the, is the company culture. And I came into this culture with my current company with it being public, but it, it's been established for so long that um, it's, a, it's an incredible place to work and they make you feel like you are part of the family. It doesn't, it doesn't have that like public company feel. Specific to my industry, it was just understanding REITs, real estate investments, trusts, and how they work in the tax structure, et cetera, to be able to, um, to be able to comply with all of that stuff. So compliance and company culture are what changes the most during a, during a change from, I'm going to keep this up here because I don't want to get brown on anything. It'll dry here. Um, yeah, those are the two biggest things that change. I miss the, you know, the company I work for now is the fourth largest owner of apartments in the country, all, all across the country. And we develop them, we build them all. We've got a ton here. We've got a ton everywhere. It is the most, I compare it to Chicago. It is a small town feel with a big city. You know, it's a small company feel there. We all have roles, but there's no such thing as, hey, this is your title and this is what you do. You don't do anything else. They very much want you, they very much expect you to cross-pollinate and work with the other groups and be prepared to do stuff with other groups that candidly have nothing to do with what you do. But I love that mentality. I like that. I've always been a utility player. Like I'm, I'm the one to raise my hand. So it's like that situation was perfect for me in terms of finding company culture. I didn't want to be siloed. Um, it, it just doesn't do well for me. So to find that opportunity and then again, to find it literally a block from my apartment where I'm living currently was, um, was amazing. With all this insight, leading up to purchasing your dream car and your dream shoe is there anything that you would have done differently you know it's funny when it comes to the car i had wanted that car it was a grand cherokee srt so it was a 500 horsepower grand cherokee it was a special edition that was an eighty-five thousand dollar car and i had wanted that car i had owned three grand cherokees before that so i had always wanted it and led up to that led up to buying it um I always tell people every time I got in that car for the two years that I had it felt like the first time it literally, it was so amazing to drive and it was so fun and, and I'm a car guy and I like it. And, um, but to do it differently, I wouldn't have bought it even, even knowing how fun it was and even knowing that I had the money and it was 0% interest rates then. So of course I was not going to put any money down a $1,200 car payment. You know, I, I got to the point where your average person can pick out a Grand Cherokee. Someone who knows them decently well knows what an SRT looks like, knows what they're looking for to see that it's an SRT. And I became kind of known for it. Like at the gym, people would be like, oh, that's your SRT. I didn't like that. I like being the gray man. I like, if I'm going to stand out, let it be in my performance. Let it be in my ability to do something well and to contribute don't let it be in something like that because now I don't want to be defined as that person. And that's why I ended up getting rid of it. Yeah. The $1,200 car payment didn't, didn't help. But at the same time, I didn't like that. That's what I was defined as. So if I went back, I wouldn't have bought it. I, as much as I enjoyed it, it was the most fun purchase 
and the most financially irresponsible that I've ever had. So I feel like I did it right in the sense where I had it for two years. So I got to experience it, saw what it was like, and then sold it for more than it was worth. And I've never done that with a car in my entire life. When it comes to these shoes, there's nothing I would have done different. I didn't get a super flashy shoe because I wanted it to be, it goes back into my mentality of earlier of kind of wanting to be the gray man. Like I wanted them to be nice, but I didn't want, I needed them to be something I could wear every day. You know, I drove that car every day, but I was known for it and people would honk or people would stop me and, and ask about it. I had a guy at a gas station once that was working there, come out from the shop and he goes, damn, he's like, I've, he's like, I've always seen these. He's like, I've never actually worked on one. Never met this guy in my entire life. I was like, you ever driven one? He goes, no. And I was like, you want to take it around the block? And he's like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, not a problem. So I jumped in the car with him, took it around the block. He drove it carefully. I said, drive it over here to this road. And I said, now put it in park. And I said, now floor it. It was like, you should know what this thing can do at 500 horsepower. And it just made his day. And ever since when I was there, every time I would go in, he would come out and he'd be like, hey, do you want some snacks or something? He's like, just take whatever you want in there. He would just get, and, it's, and I, never, I never took advantage of it. It was like, you know what? Like, I remember what it was like, man. I remember what it was like seeing that car and being like one day, like maybe I can drive that one day, you know? And like, here's a guy who works on cars, knows more about them than I do. And he's never gotten to see it. He's never gotten to drive it. I'll take the risk. I'm not gonna let him take it by himself, but I'll take the risk that I'm in the car with him and that we'll be all right for him to experience that because like it, it made his day. So something like that, like, you know, and certain friends I would let drive it and, and try it out. When it comes to shoes, there's nothing I'd do differently. I didn't get an aggressive shoe because I wanted something that I could wear every day. And that's, you know, what these were good for. And I take care of them. So, but with the car, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever admitted that to anyone. Like, I think there are people who knew spending $85,000 and now I was making 250 a year. So like, I could easily afford the car, but just because you can doesn't mean you should, you know? And like, I, I shouldn't have, it was not the right move to make when I was, let's see, that was a 2016 and I bought it in 2015. So nine years ago, you know, I was 33, 32. It was not the car that I, I needed. Um, but it was fun. I don't regret the fun. I regret the purchase. <laughs> Would you say there's an unknown price that's associated with your dreams that you're not aware of until you own it? So, for example, you gave up your anonymity. Is that the word? In yeah. Terms of not a lot of folks knowing you. Autonomy, being able yeah. To blend in and everything else and once that once you realize you are losing the thing that you were not only comfortable with but that was a part of you the sacrifice was gonna have to be the dream so i think in general that's true you know we can stick with the car example but i'd like to talk about that in general the car example was here's something people don't think of so i spent thousands of dollars on cleaning supplies very similar to my shoes i had researched for months how to take care of this car. I was living in a house that had the ability, so I, I never I never once touched a car wash. I did it myself, and I would spend minimum of two hours, but probably four to six hours on a weekend. Well, here's what that did with my girlfriend. Here's how she liked that that much. I can leave it at that. And so it was like, it did cost me, it didn't cost me a relationship, but it was an obsession and it was something that I gave up time, you know, time to me. You know, people talk about the, the five love languages. Well, there's only one to me. To me, it's quality time. Like time is the only resource we can't make more of. So for me, and to not give that quality time, that's another reason why I'd go back and I'd do it differently. I wouldn't have bought it is I would have spent that time doing what I should have been doing, which was fostering and building that relationship. And so on a grander level, I think when you get those dreams, you know, say you become CEO, um, you know, I take a look at my brother-in-law was CEO of his company before they sold it. Phenomenal dad who is there for everything has no problem. But I see so many CEOs who don't 
aren't there for their family, aren't there for their friends, and at what cost, you know? So for me, sometimes reaching your dreams, what's the best way to put this? I had, I had done it, I had gotten that car, I had gotten certain titles, I got these shoes, I had done it. I had done it cruelly because I hadn't done it in a way that was up to my standards or my morals. Um, and I didn't sacrifice that much on the, on the morality side, but I think when people find their dreams, you know, when you're in a partnership, you know, specifically with the relationships, a lot of the dreams that I've found and that I've done, whether it's a traveling situation or it's a work situation, you know, I've had to remind myself in the past few years when I'm dating someone, like I'm no longer thinking about, I'm, I'm thinking for two. I gotta be thinking for two. So I think a lot of the times when people reach their dreams, their family, like, military is a good example, you know, where you get to a certain rank and, and your wife is a co-pilot at best, you know, and she's a second thought with everything in terms of where you move, in terms of what you do. So I think reaching those things certainly has a cost. I would say that where I've seen that cost be the most expensive is in relationships. And that bothers me because I, there's a balance there. I've always said there's like a number I'd like to make. Like my number would be three to 350, you know, in full disclosure. And, and the reason being is because it would be double what my parents made together. And I had a great life growing up, but it's not enough where it would be so much responsibility that came along with it. I'm not the CEO, I'm not the general, I, I don't wanna be, I'm the lieutenant. I'm, I, give me the orders, you say, I don't need instruction, I just need you to say, Brad, this needs to get done, here's when it needs to get done by, I'll execute, I'll execute it every time. I don't wanna be the ideas guy, I don't wanna do that stuff. To do that, yeah, you can reach your dreams in terms of getting certain titles, but you give up a lot along the way. And those incremental dollars that come with it now there's an inverse relationship between those incremental dollars that came and those relationships and that time I missed out on going to, you know, my dad went to every sporting event that I went to, you know, but like, and my brother-in-law goes to almost all of, all of his sons. Um, but you miss out on certain things in life. And like, I don't think I'll ever sit there. I don't think about mortality too often, but I don't think I'll ever sit there and go, damn, like, I can't believe I missed out on not making X or, you know, I missed out on this title or that title. Like titles don't mean a dick to me. Like I, I could care less, you know, they call me director. Well, you can call me whatever you want. Like just give me the work-life balance. And so that's been my focus. So I don't give up those things in the future and focusing on purchases like a car or shoes going, is this money better suited somewhere else? Because you do, you do give up a lot. And where I see that a lot is in relationships. I never felt like I gave up a sense of self. And I think that's why I was not as successful in sales and in brokerage because I wouldn't give that up. Um, but I feel like reaching dreams, a lot of times you give up a sense of self, but I think of it more because I'm such a team guy. I think of the external factors you give up. And that to me is relationships, whether it's friends, family, partner. So that's what I worry about. I think that's well said. <clears throat> did you want to work on your everyday shoe next in the meantime? Or did you want to just keep it to the dream shoe? I'll keep it to the dream shoe just because this might get a little messier. Mm -hmm. I realized that. I should have brought just a couple pair of leather ones. I, You know what I'll do for the, <laughs> for the everyday shoe is when I do towels, mm -hmm. I'll put them in with the washing machine. Then if there's marks left over, I've got like a sneaker cleaner mm -hmm. and then I put a protectant on top of them. Okay, okay. And so that's just my, that's my process. But that cleaner mm -hmm. needs water and stuff and it gets soapy and it's like, why, why? I got water for you. Is, why deal with that issue? No, it, it, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be splashing everywhere around your place. I mean, it's fine. I really do just Swiffer the whole area after you guys are done anyway. Oh, I, I Swiffer at least one. Yeah, I've got two big dogs. I have Pitbull and Doberman. <laughs> I, sw I Swiffer in vacuum. Yeah. Every day. 
every single damn day, you know? And it's like, when I move into the new place, it'll be two levels and mm -hmm. I'll need to do it there too. But I don't like, I wear shoes in my apartment because I don't like having the, the dog hair on the bottom of my feet. Yeah. What was I going to say? Um, did you want to talk about failure? Sure. I remember that was one thing you said you wanted to spin the block to have a conversation on. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about it. Okay. What does failure mean to you? You know, I had this coach in, in high school, a really good guy. Um, he was the first dual athlete African-American at Harvard University playing lacrosse and soccer. And I remember him giving a speech one day. It could almost make me tear up because it, it literally like, of all the things people have said to me, this one stuck out the most. And people have heard this before, but maybe it was just him com coming from him. He said, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. So when I waste my talent or when I don't do something to my capabilities, I consider that a failure. And I can think of major failures in my life where I really let other people down. And that... That's a tough memory to swallow. Those are the, you know, it's like, I remember some of the big wins in life, but man, just because of who I am, like, I can remember those failures like yesterday, like feel the fire on my face of certain failures. And I'm happy to talk about any of it because um, there's definitely certain instances, but that's not reaching your potential and I mean, on, let's be on, on a myopic level, on a small level, one day you didn't reach your potential because you decided to sleep in. I don't consider that a failure. You know, I'm talking about the big things in life, the things that matter, where people are counting on you or it's you versus you and you need to win and you didn't get it done. And you could have, you know, it was not insurmountable. And those are the times where I feel like I failed. Can you give me an example? Yeah, um, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you two. The first one was work. Like I explained, um, I was a group of 12 and we were doing really well and I was on my way up and I was supported by a guy. So I was like a junior broker and making good money and 10 out of those 12 people left and they asked me to come and I stayed back to plug holes in the ship because there was a lot of money left on the table there too. And they had non-competes. So I'll keep this one short, but I couldn't, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it done. I couldn't prop it up because now once their non-competes ended, I'm going against 10 people who have done this much longer than me. So why are you going to pay me the same commission you'd pay someone who's done this for 20 years? I agree. I, I fully got it. Um, How does a non-compete change the way you would go about business? Well, when the non-compete was there and they moved to a different brokerage group, they had six months where they could not contact their clients at all. Well, those clients were already in the hopper working on things. So I took those things over. So I was able to do those and make really good money in that time period because it wasn't only my uh, runway and platform. I was taking from everybody else's too. So, but once, once those non-competes were over, it was an easy argument for them to explain why it was better to go with them than it was for me. And quite honestly, if someone had asked me and... <laughs> You know, I can say this now because I'm not in the role. I would, I would, I would have advised them to do the same to go with those folks if I were being honest. Um, you know, and and that it didn't necessarily lead to, but that you know, it, it kind of leads to a another story, the the bigger story of failure to me. Um, you know, shortly after that happened, and I was I wasn't able to keep the the ship propped up and get things back in line. And and by the way, that was not. The, the company was not really upset about that because it wasn't a business unit that they were. It used to be, long story short, it used to be a big part of their revenue. It became a smaller part of their revenue as it went on. So it wasn't a big deal if it failed. It was just an opportunity for me to try. But, you know, most stressful time of my life. And then I had my head injury and I collapsed and I fractured the four bones of my skull and had two brain hemorrhages. You know, they look for drugs, alcohol, aneurysms, all the scary, scary stuff. Chalked it up to stress. Well, it was probably the most stressful time of my life. So... About eight months after that, as I'm getting better, 
I thought I needed a change in life. And I did. I needed a change in, in work, in my attitude, in my mentality. But where my mind went was that I needed a change in my relationship. And I broke up with the woman who I had been with for five years, who took care of me during, during my injury. And, um, you know, I, I tried, you know, later, like after going to therapy, I realized that my mind was just focused on the wrong things. And I needed to refocus that. And I tried to get her back, like to the point of even bought her a diamond, like didn't buy the full ring, bought the diamond because I was hoping, you know, if, if she said yes, like if she was devastated. I, I don't even want to go back to thinking about the conversation when I broke up with her. Cause I can remember every word. And like I said, I feel that fire on my face now. And, um, by the time I tried to get her back and, you know, I paid for couples counseling, I did everything it took. I had a good buddy of mine, quiet guy, a couple years ago said, Hey, by the way, I wanted you to know, he's like, I don't think I ever told you this, but you know, all of your good friends, like saw what you went through and you couldn't have done more than what you did. He just said, you left it all on the field. And so you know, I bought that, I bought that diamond and, um, she thought about it and then she said no. And she moved on. And like, to this day, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not friends with her or any of her friends on social media, but I know she's married and I'm, you know, the day a few years ago, I found out she's married. I smiled. I was like, <laughs> I really was happy about that. And I didn't, I didn't think about it much afterward. I, I don't to this day, you know, what chokes me up now is thinking about the breakup, but that, that will always be the biggest failure of my life, at least up until now, um, was not, and that was on me. Like, not because I broke up with her, but because I recognized I needed change and I didn't recognize correctly what that change was. When quite honestly, and I'm sure there were people in my life, I know my brother-in-law said to me, are you sure you want to do this? Like, I, I know, but I was so fixated that that needed to be the change. And I was wrong. And by the time I tried to, to get it back, it was... Um, it was too late. So it doesn't haunt me to lose her in that sense anymore. I don't, but it haunts me to lose over something that, yeah, I had an accident. Yeah. I was going through a rough time. Yeah. Super depressed, but like I had control to be a critical thinker had I sat down and done that correctly. So that's the real failure to me isn't losing Lily. It's not having taken a deeper look at myself and said, what, you know, what really needs to change just because your mind immediately goes to one thing, you know, it's like, doesn't mean you need to pull the trigger, pulling a gun out. doesn't mean you need to pull the trigger. And I, I pulled the trigger and that was, that was, um, that was just a big, a, a tough moment. And then like the last one was me getting a job over the past two years. Like there wasn't, it's a success story. So that's great. And, but it could have turned into a really ugly failure story. So, but it was interesting because as much as those two aren't the same, the relationship story with Lily and me getting a new job, I definitely took more time to go, all right, what can I change? What do I need to be? I'm doing things. I'm not getting where I need to be. What do I need to change to do that? I was a lot more self-aware, a lot more introspective and like, didn't attribute that to my relationship situation. But I think subconsciously my mind said, you know, you've known failure. Like, how do you, 
how do you turn this into a better situation? And so that was my mentality every day waking up. How can I turn this into a better situation? So, you know, those two failures are, you know, career wise and relationship wise outside of dumb sports. Like those are the two ones and, and of the two, I only regret one and it's because it was within my control. What have you learned about yourself from failure? I'll tell you what. <laughs> Failing, you know, over the past two years where I wouldn't necessarily call it failure, but I, I call it struggle and not getting to where I need to be. You know, I, I had a buddy who was in town and he said, you know, Brad, he was a ex special operations guy with a tier one unit. And he, he had said, Brad, I've seen some guys do some incredible stuff. And he goes, and I've seen a lot of good guys do a lot of bad stuff. And he said, as far as hardship goes, he said, when you weren't paying attention, the rest of your four closest friends were. And he said, I've never seen someone go through the adversity you went through and tried to keep a positive attitude and was as resilient as possible. And I think, I think the first thing it taught me is that God meant me to last because there are so many folks who have had it a lot harder than me, but you know, over the past eight years, it's been pretty brutal and now like feeling like I'm on the come up like I would never sit there and go man it was all worth it like fuck no like I wouldn't go through that again for this I, I think I could have gotten this and deserved this before this but I think what it taught me is that I'm meant to be resilient and as cliche as it is learn from those mistakes. Because I think a lot of the times with my failures or I wouldn't even call them failures, but non-success or where I didn't get to where I wanted to be, I'd repeat the same behaviors. Thinking, you know, it's that whole Einstein quote, doing the same thing over and over and expecting things to change is the definition of insanity. And it's like, I would literally repeat the same behaviors and almost blame others and be like, well, no, they don't get it. You know, it's like, this isn't on me, I'm doing it right. And then I had to sit there over the past couple of years and go, okay, how do I change my mentality, you know? And so I hope that I take that with me going forward in all future endeavors. Cause I got to tell you, my dad always told me growing up, I went to the school of hard knocks. Like they, they tell the kid not to touch a stove. The only way they learn is if they touch it. Well, I always touched it. So, you know, I hope that I listen to the folks around me more and find ways to change my behaviors to get to where I need to be. That's what failure has taught me so far. This is a day in my shoes. <laughs>